already have a question. Ah, there, no, it's just uh, Asan saying that he's glad to see you again. That's good. Okay, um, so uh, I'll, I'll start us off here just by uh, introducing the Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, and uh, we're happy to get started in 2022 with an eminent speaker from Harvard. And I'll turn it over to Professor Kate Larson to introduce Professor Melin Tambe. Okay, thank you, Jesse. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce Melin Tambe, who's the Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science and the Director of the Center for Research and Computation and Society at Harvard University, as well as the Director of AI for Social Good um, at Google Research India. So Melind has received numerous honors and awards, so much, you know, it's way too long a list for me to begin to list them all here, but I do want to uh, talk about what I like about his work in particular. Um, I find that uh, sort of Melind's work along with those of his research groups sort of has found a way to balance um, sort of foundational and algorithmic contributions in AI and uh, multi-agent systems sort of coupled with impactful deployments of, this, of the systems that they deploy to address these complex societal problems. So um, welcome, Melind. I am so happy that you're able to you know, visit us at Waterloo, and I'm greatly looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you, Kate. Thank you uh, for this very kind uh, introduction and uh, really appreciate this invitation very much. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you, as I've known Kate for a very long time and really appreciated her guidance of the AMAS community, the multi agent systems community that we both belong to. So I'm going to talk today about AI for social impact. Let's just jump right uh, into the topic. For the past 15 years, me and my research team have focused on advancing AI and multi agent systems for social impact focusing on topics of public health, conservation and public safety and security with the key challenge of how to optimize our limited intervention resources. Let me just jump right into some of the lessons that we've learned. First, achieving social impact and AI innovation go hand in hand. With respect to public health, we have large populations to serve but limited public health resources. Concrete example is work we've done with youth experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles where Harnessing the social networks of these youth, we are able to show that our AI algorithms are far more effective in spreading HIV information and reducing HIV risk behaviors compared to traditional approaches. But this required innovation in the area of social network influence maximization and bandit algorithms. With respect to conservation, we have large conservation areas to protect but limited number of ranger resources. Concrete example is work we have done in Uganda and Cambodia. We're harnessing past poaching data. We are able to predict where poachers set traps or snares. And for the past several years, have been able to remove thousands, if not tens of thousands of these snares. But this work required us to innovate in the area of what we call green security games, which combines machine learning and game theory. With respect to public safety and security, we've contributed a new model called Stackleberg Security Games, contributed new algorithms, that have been in use by agencies such as the US Coast Guard, the Federal Air Marshals. Again, this required innovation in the area of uh, game theoretic algorithms. Now, it may seem like these are very different application areas, but they are tied together by common underlying models that come from this area of multi agent systems research. Today's talk will focus on public health and conservation. Lesson number two is all of this work required partnerships with communities and nonprofits from beginning to end of the entire development process. I've shown here some logos of the nonprofits we have worked with. Our ultimate goal is to empower these nonprofits to use AI tools and avoid being gatekeepers to AI technology for social impact. Third, the entire data to deployment pipeline is important. So if we think about how we start, it's with immersion in the domain, trying to work with a nonprofit to understand the kind of data that are available, the kind of problems that they face. Following that, a predictive model makes predictions on which of the cases faced by the nonprofit are high risk versus low risk. Since we can't intervene on all of the high risk cases, this is where our multi agent reasoning intervention recommends to us which high risk cases to actually intervene on. And finally, field testing and deployment is important, not only because we want to 
test and validate our models in the field, but because social impact itself is a key object. And if you're thinking about AI for social impact, you have to show social impact. Otherwise, it is just AI, but not AI for social impact. Often in our literature, we focus on the middle of this pipeline that is building clever algorithms. But in AI for social impact, the entire pipeline is really important. So in today's talk with those lessons out of the way, I'm going to focus on four projects that we've worked on. I'll pay more attention to the first two and then try to go relatively quickly through the remaining two. In each case, there is a technique and an application domain. I'll cover papers from the last roughly four or five years published at AMAS, AAA, HKI, NeurIPS. I'll focus more on the real world results, but there's a lot more simulation results in our papers as well. I highlight the role of the key PhD student and postdoc by putting up their picture in the top right hand corner of the slide on which their work is shown. So let's start with this maternal and childcare problem in India, where situation is very difficult. Um, a woman dies in childbirth every 15 minutes. Four out of 10 children are too thin or short. Two children under age five die every minute. And we are very fortunate that we work with a nonprofit called Arman, which works with 26 million beneficiaries or mothers in India in 19 states, works with 97 hospitals. So it's a big NGO. And that's working on this challenge of maternal and child care. Um, the founder of this uh, nonprofit, Dr. Aparna Hegde, uh, in a very inspirational talk she gave at TED, talks about how a pregnancy is not a disease, childhood is not an ailment, and dying due to natural life events is not acceptable. So one of their programs is called M Mitra, our mobile friend. It's a weekly two minute automated message to new or expecting mothers. It's something like you're three months into your pregnancy, you should use this health supplement or your baby is three months old, enroll the baby in this government program. And Arman has shown that in their random, via randomized control trials that women who listen to these health messages, 141 of them, from the time the mother enrolls all the way to the baby being one year old. If mothers listen, new or expecting mothers listen to this set of messages that there are significant benefits to their own health and the health of the babies. 2.2 million women have enrolled in this program so far. So where do we come in? Unfortunately, a significant fraction, 30 to 40% of the mothers who enroll become low listeners or drop out of the program. Now, Arman has a service call center from where they can make a limited number of service calls to some number of beneficiaries. And that's where we come in, how to optimize this limited intervention resource. So consider an example, 200,000 mothers have enrolled in this program, Amitra, and you can make service calls to 4,000 of them per week. And of course, these 200,000 keep changing, but now we have a health worker who has to decide who to call. In this example, I'm just showing you a health worker who has just five mothers under her care. Four of them have not listened to this Amitra message. One of them has shown in green. She decides to call the first two mothers to encourage them to listen to these Amitra messages. As a result, the first two turn green they start listening. A third one on her own decides to listen, but two are still red. Now, again, the health worker has to decide who to call next week to encourage them. If she decides the last two, this turns out to be not such a good choice because not only these two mothers uh, not listen anymore, the first two who are also listening have stopped listening. The point being that we face this challenge that a call, a service call may not change a beneficiary state. A beneficiary may change their state on their own. And yet we have to continue to prioritize a small number of beneficiaries per week. We model this problem as a restless bandit where we have to select K out of N arms per week. So for those who may not be familiar in a restless bandit, each arm is a markup decision problem. A mother can be in a bad state. She didn't listen to the health message this week or a good state, she listened to a health message. 
there is a transition probability of going from a bad state to a bad state or a good state. And this transition probability depends on whether there was a service call or not. If there's an intervention, a service call, the probability of going from a bad state to good state increases. If there is no service call, the mother has a higher chance of remaining in a bad state. In reality, of course, we have hundreds of thousands of these arms because each arm is a beneficiary and there are so many beneficiaries we have. And we have to efficiently select the top K arms that would give us, that would allow us to optimize our limited resources. So solving this problem optimally is difficult. So we rely on this idea of a Whittle index where we compute a Whittle index for the current state of each arm, which essentially computes the benefit of intervention and then pick the top K arms. So a Whittle index is essentially a subsidy that you can give to the passive action that is of not intervention such that its Q value becomes the same as the Q value of intervention. We, so essentially by computing this Whittle index, we then pick the arms with the top K Whittle indices. We use an algorithm we have developed in the past in 2016 to compute this Whittle index efficiently. So one problem in this application though, is that whereas previous work had assumed that the transition probabilities are known, here the transition probabilities, the model parameters are not known. So we have to learn them. Unfortunately, we have past beneficiary data where we have features like age, income, education level, et cetera, for each mother and the engagement sequence. What was their state, bad or good? And then what was the action and whether action meaning they got intervened on or not and whether they changed their state. So we have this past data for some set of beneficiaries in the past. And from that, we have to infer the transition probabilities for new mothers. So the way we do this, we take the past data, we cluster it and then learn a map from our features to these clusters. So basically for each mother, income, age, education level, et cetera, we can map it to a transition probability for that mother. So when we get a new mother uh, who comes into this program, we can predict her transition probabilities of basically her behavior. And using that, we can compute these Whittle indices and pick the top K mothers to call. The advantage of using clustering is that it compensates for lack of data and also speeds up Whittle index computation because we are only computing Whittle index for the 40 or so clusters instead of a very large number of mothers. So we did recently, uh, and we published this in AAA 22, a study with 23,000 beneficiaries in the field. It's the first large scale application, as far as we know, of restless multi-arm bandits for public health. We divided these 23,000 into three groups. 7,667 were in the restless bandit group, same number in the round robin group, same number in the current standard of care group. In the round in the restless bandit group, the RMAP group, we pulled 225 arms per week. We called 225 mothers per week. These were the mothers with the top fetal indices every week. In the round robin group, we first picked the first 225, then the next 225, et cetera. The current standard of care group, there is no service call going out because that is the current standard of care. And now we want to know how many more messages were listened to by mothers in the round robin group compared to the current standard of care group and the restless bandit group compared to the current standard of care group. And here's what we find. Along the X axis are different weeks. Along the Y axis are how many more messages that the mothers listen to over the current standard of care group. And you can see that in the restless bandit group, there's 600 more messages that have been listened to by the mothers compared to the round robin group where very few more messages were listened to by the mothers. The point being that optimization of who you give a service call to is important. You can't just pick people at random or in a round robin fashion, you wouldn't get any benefit of, of the service calls. If you look at it in terms of statistical significance, the restless bandit group, is we have statistically significant improvement over current standard of care, round robin, there is not. There's a nice video that Google made that was featured in the Google for India event. Um, and here 
they feature Dr. Aparna Hegde, who talks about, we are able to reach out to more and more women each week and get them back into the fold and save lives because of AI. She talked about the work that I just showed. And they also have a mother interviewed who was able to listen to more of these health messages because of the service calls she got because of our work and says how I'll follow all the advice and take good care of my baby. Our goal now is to transition this software to Arman and assist 1 million beneficiaries by 2023. Now, there's a lot of research that needs to happen in this area to continue to advance this kind of service that we can provide beneficiaries. First, you know, I showed you a comparison with a Vital Index based policy. What if we had chosen a simpler greedy policy based in the restless bandage? So here we did, since we have all of this data from doing these experiments with uh, 23,000 beneficiaries and more, we can use that to build a simulation, which we did, and then conduct in simulation a similar study where we are comparing Vittle versus greedy approach and a random approach. And we can show that the Vittle index approach in simulation performs much better than a greedy approach applied to the restless bandage. But there's many other very interesting topics of research. In the work we did with data to deployment, we start with immersion, getting the data from Arman, and there's learning features to transition probabilities of the mothers, so age, income, et cetera, what is her behavior. Following that, we choose the top K mothers to call using vital indices. And then of course we deploy. And I can see here, this is a stage-by-stage -stage optimization. This is a stage-by-stage -stage approach we have taken. First, we learn to maximize our learning accuracy. Then we maximize decision quality separately. However, maximizing learning accuracy doesn't necessarily lead to maximizing decision quality. And to give an intuitive example of how this might happen, consider this figure here where it's a simplified figure, but basically on the x-axis is one feature and the y-axis is the transition probability of the mother. We are going to predict transition probability and choose high risk arms. The high risk arms are shown in red, low risk arms shown in blue. We can see that to the left of the orange line are all the low risk arms and to the right are all the high risk arms in terms of value of the feature. Now, if you take a stage by stage approach, the two stage approach, basically, if you first learn something for high accuracy, you learn what, what is shown by the green line to make predictions about transition probabilities based on feature values. This is high learning accuracy because it gets all the blue points, which are in plenty, but it gets all the low risk points and doesn't predict the high risk cases. And what this means is it has low decision quality, even though it has high learning accuracy. In decision focused learning, we modify the loss function to directly maximize decision quality. What this means is we get the green line that is shown to make predictions of transition probabilities. Clearly you can see that it has low learning accuracy because it doesn't get all the blue points, right? But it gets a higher decision quality because it gets the red points, which are more important for our decision, predicts them accurately. So this decision-focused learning approach is what we've used for Arman. Again, these results are from simulations from the data we gathered. So two-stage, again, it's trying to pass gradients back from trying to make sure the MDP model is accurate, whereas a decision-focused learning approach tries to maximize decision quality and pass gradients back from this decision quality. So in terms of predictive accuracy, the stage-by-stage -stage approach shown in orange performs better. But in terms of final policy performance, we can see that a decision-focused learning approach leads to higher quality decision-making in the end. So this is a very active area of research for us. A second area, is inspired by tuberculosis prevention. Tuberculosis, remember, is also a major uh, killer disease. It kills half a million people in India per year. Three million are infected. A patient has to take six months of pills to get treated for TB. And this is work done jointly with a nonprofit called Everwell. And you can imagine, I have trouble if I'm taking a six-day course uh, for some kind of antibiotic course. 
Here you have someone who's required to take six months of these pills. It's very difficult. But if they don't take these pills, this means this will lead to more drug resistant bacteria. So we have to encourage people to complete this treatment. So again, we have this health worker who is tasked to call these patients to encourage them to take their medicine every day. So she has all these patients, supposing she decides to call the first three patients. This is when she learns that the first two had taken their medicine last night and the last one had not. Having this information, now she has to decide who do I call today, tom uh, tomorrow to remind them to take their medicine. So she may call the next three patients. Now you may see this problem is quite similar to the problem I showed you for the Arman case with the mothers, except there's partial observability. The health worker doesn't know the current state of the patient, whether they took their medicine or not. So in our nearest 2020 paper, we showed an approach to deal with this partial observability. So when there is no observation about a patient, we update their beliefs based on a transition inference of their transition probabilities. When we get an observation, like we call the patient, that's when we know, oh, they took their medicine last night. So now the uncertainty has collapsed. We know their state or they didn't take their medicine. This collapsing approach is why we call it collapsing bandage. We use that to develop a fast algorithm. And we can also show that collapsing bandage are indexable, i.e. we get some optimality guarantees. We can show also that with these collapsing bandage algorithms, we can develop faster algorithms as shown in blue that runs much faster than the previous state of the art while giving up very little in terms of solution quality. So there are many very interesting areas to explore. Um, Q learning, if you don't have past data to interact, to learn a model from interacting with the beneficiaries, risk awareness and robustness and so forth. I'm now going to switch over to a second project, which is on social networks and HIV prevention. So there's a, can I interrupt? There's a few questions. Could I, could I uh, bother you with sure. a few questions now, or do you want me to wait? Um, maybe I'll just walk through 10 more minutes and, okay. then take, uh, okay. and then take all the questions at that point. Thank you. Thank you for all those questions. Please uh, keep them coming. I'll definitely get to them. So this problem was motivated. I was at USC at the time uh, and right outside was a encampment of homeless people. So it was highly motivating to think about what can we do. And so this is work done jointly with the School of Social Work at USC. So there's 6,000 youth who sleep on the streets of Los Angeles every night. And our goal here is to prevent HIV in youth experiencing homelessness because the rates of HIV in this population are 10 times the rate of the normal house population. So homeless shelters, since they can't talk to all 6,000 youth, will use a peer leader based approach to spread information about HIV prevention. So they'll call in peer leaders educate them about HIV prevention, expect these youth to talk to their friends and their friends to talk to their friends about safe sex and so forth in order to reduce HIV, prevent, HIV being spread. Remember, this is real face-to-face -face interaction amongst friends, not over Facebook. So we have given a social network. Each number here is a youth. Each red edge is a friendship between two youth. And we have to select three of these youth, let's say, or 40 of these youth and educate them as shown in this example where our social work colleague is teaching a few of these youth to maximize the expected number of influence nodes who know about HIV prevention. So the way this information is supposed to spread, if we educate youth C about HIV prevention, their neighboring youth, their friend D will be informed with some probability 0.4, which is the propagation probability, and D will then talk to E, their friend with the probability of 0.4, and information will cascade in this network in this fashion. So this is the independent cascade model. Now, this is another lesson. Some of the research challenges in AI for social impact definitely arise because we just have lack of data and uncertainty is a key feature. So in this example, whereas traditional models of influence maximization in social networks assume that all those probabilities that I mentioned are known in advance. In our case, there's uncertainty in the propagation probability over edges. We don't know those probabilities. 
we need a multi-step dynamic policies because we can call in these youth to educate them, but they may or may not show up. So we need dynamic policies to handle no-shows. And thirdly, the social network itself, which is assumed as an input in this literature, is not available. So we can use a limited budget to query a few of the youth and uncover a sample of the network, but that's all we can do. So I'm gonna sketch some ways we solve these problems here. So first I said that, you know, normally in the literature it's assumed that if you talk to a youth C, you know the probability with which their friend D will be influenced. But in reality, we don't know that probability. We can model this uncertainty as sampling the probability of propagation from some distribution. We may not know even the mean of this distribution. So we assume it lies within some interval. And now we have this problem of robust influence maximization. So on the one hand, we, so we, the way we cast this problem is a zero sum game against nature. So we have an algorithm that is trying to choose peer leaders to maximize spread of influence. And nature is trying to choose parameter settings to cause our algorithms to perform as worse as possible. So we are trying to maximize and nature is trying to minimize where the payoff is measured as a ratio of the outcome of our policy to the optimal possible had we known nature's parameter settings in advance. So this is some sort of a measure of regret. There are details here about mixed strategies and pure strategies. I'm going to leave this to the paper. If you're interested, it's in AMA 17. But I'm going to sketch for you how we solve the game. So if you think about a network of 400 youth, and we have to choose 40 peer leaders, that's 400 choose 40. It's a massive number of policies for the influencer. Nature is trying to choose parameter settings from a continuous interval. Massive number of parameter settings for nature. So representing this game in memory is difficult, let alone trying to solve it. So we solve it using this double oracle approach. So essentially we initialize the game with a small number of policies on both sides. And then through an iterative fashion, the influencer oracle will add its best response. The nature's oracle will add its best response. And we iteratively grow the game until convergence. And it converges often in a small number of iterations and we can show that we can converge with approximation guarantees. So this is how we get to robust influence maximization. The second is this idea of exploratory influence maximization. You can imagine we call our social work colleagues to a homeless shelter and say, hey, you, uh, you know, find out what is the social network, who's friends with whom. But this is a very costly approach to first map out the full social network of this homeless youth community and then do influence maximization. Instead, we had to come up with an approach whereby we could query just 15% of the nodes in the population. We went, we go to 15% of the youth only in the population. And we ask them, who are your top five friends? And use this kind of a querying approach to then figure out who to choose as peer leaders. The trick is of course, which, which nodes to sample. So we want to Output, even though we have small sampled a small fraction of the network, we still want to output K peer leaders nodes to spread influence such that the performance is similar to the optimal possible had we known the full network in advance. And we show, a, we have a sampling algorithm presented in AAA 2018, which samples nodes randomly, estimates the size of the communities that the nodes belong to, and chooses seeds from the largest K communities. There are some guarantees on the algorithm, I'm gonna skip those. We built a system called Change, which is used, which uses this network sampling algorithm. It uses the robust influence maximization approach, and then ultimately tells us which peer leaders we should select. We ran a study with uh, 750 youth. This was joint work with Professor Eric Rice of Social Work, and here we had three arms: Change, which is our algorithm. Degree centrality, which is the traditional approach of bringing in the most popular youth and control group, there's no intervention at all. And then we looked at what was the change in HIV risk behavior one month after intervention and three months after intervention in each of these three arms. As far as we know, this is the first large scale application of influence maximization for public health conducted in collaboration with My French Place, Los Angeles LGBT Center and Safe Place for Youth three homeless drop-in centers in Los Angeles. And so 
we have three arms and we're trying to look at reduction in HIV risk behaviors. So in each arm, we selected peer leaders. And here's what we find at the end of one month in terms of reduction in condomless anal sex change, our algorithm led to the largest reduction, more than 30% compared to degree centrality and control, which has no difference at all. At the end of three months, degree centrality begins to catch up with change, but still worse. And the fact that change was able to cause this reduction faster is important because this is a risk behavior. And also this is a community where people come and go and therefore having this behavior change happen faster is important. We also see similar behaviors in terms of reduction in condomless vaginal sex. There's statistical significance results in our papers. And here's what one of our collaborators had to say. Beautiful way to kind of like marry this, this tech world with this social service world, like and how we can, we can kind of go deeper and impact young people and elevate them. We have looked at approaches to improve fairness now as a next step. So if you look at how influence spreads among different members of the community, we see that there's disparities and we can address these fairness challenges. We've looked at max min fairness, where we maximize minimum utility of any community. Diversity constraints is a concept from game theory, but in the end, an inequity aversion approach that we show essentially gives the control over to a policymaker rather than providing a point trade-off, it allows the policymaker to choose how much trade-off to make in terms of fairness versus performance. More recent work is looking at reinforcement learning to try to do network sampling better and to look at influence maximization being sped up by training on some training networks. And then at test time, you're just running the policy rather than running the full algorithm. But these are all different pieces and running end-to-end -end with reinforcement learning and testing in the field is an exciting area for future work. So I'm going to end this section and take some questions by talking about some of the work we did uh, for agent-based modeling for COVID-19. And in particular, so we published a few papers. I'm going to pick this one on science advances because this is the one of test sensitivity that gets cited a lot in newspapers and so forth. And here we were fortunate to collaborate with Professor Michael Mina, who was at that time professor in the Chan School of Public Health at Harvard. And one of the problems he worked with uh, that we were fortunate enough to work with him on was in this testing, looking at different COVID testing policies. So you can imagine a campus like Harvard, yeah, or maybe uh, your own campus, a lot of students, and now you want to test them. And the idea is you're going to test them and anybody is positive, you isolate them. You can imagine testing every student using this gold standard PCR test. What this means is it it's, can detect very low viral concentrations, uh, 10 to the power three here, but the cost is high and you get results back after 24 hours. This antigen strep, which is less sensitive, rapid test as it's called, requires higher viral concentration, but cost is low and you get results back in 15 minutes at home. Now, which one should you choose? So we did agent-based modeling simulations. Now, if we imagine that we could run both tests on a population or we could run either test on a population equally frequently every three days and isolate people who are positive and we get results back instantaneously, then indeed, the PCR test shown in blue is better because it reduces the total number of infections as shown on the y-axis. However, if there's a one day delay to get results back as is often is with the PCR test, then there's a one day delay in isolating positive individuals and the benefit we get from the more sensitive test is lost. Also because of the cost, if the university says we're only running, we're going to run PCR tests every five days instead of every three days, again, the advantage of the more sensitive test is lost. There's more infections. The point being that rapid turnaround time and frequency is more critical than sensitivity for COVID-19 surveillance. So rapid tests are really the way to go. So this work covered uh, was covered extensively in the media and New York Times and Time and so on and so forth. We were very honored when we had Dr. Anthony Fauci talk about this paper uh, in a TV interview. And more recently, 
This is all due to Michael Mina. We were just very fortunate to have been of some assistance to him in his mission. Uh, President Biden has obviously now, we, you know, people can get these rapid tests at home. And so the fact that we could contribute to the early modeling effort in some way, we feel uh, very fortunate in that. So with that, I'm gonna stop here before going on to the next topic of uh, wildlife conservation. And now we can take some questions here. Thank you for waiting. Okay, uh, maybe I'll just read the questions and we can uh, talk about them or the question asked. So Ian Goldberg asked uh, about the calling uh, to address the issue of how often you call. So it, would that be something that could be added to the, I hope I'm reading that right, Ian, uh, the, to add it to the MDP. So not just who you call, but how often do you call them? Uh, is only the most recent choice of call, no call relevant, would not something like increasingly spaced reminders help? Right. No, this is, uh, there's a lot that can be done in terms of um, who do you give service calls to. And uh, right now, we agree that the model is simple because all it has is they listen to a message or not. Uh, there's no uh, other state information about uh, their history, you know, that they, they had got a service call and they didn't change behavior as a result or what have you. So you can imagine enriching the state representation in some way would also help. Um, you know, we have some kind of uh, notion of a sleeping state as we call it, whereby if a person gets a call, then we say for four weeks after that, we don't want to bother them because we've also seen people get annoyed. So if you call a person who has been listening and we just repeatedly try to bother them, they just feel very annoyed that this agency keeps giving service calls. And so we put them in a sleeping state so we don't bother them for four weeks. Um, but that's also an interesting, you know, how long should a sleeping state be uh, so that sometimes maybe it is useful to call them. And perhaps that was thrust of the question, but happy to, happy to uh, take the question again at the end of the talk if I haven't yeah. answered. Uh, another question from Frank Tompa was about the potential for inequity in uh, in calling people uh, because you're only calling people with phones, obviously. So, so how does that? I mean, how does that get resolved? I mean, uh, so there's two parts to this question. There's inequities uh, even within the people we are calling, in the sense that the restless bandit is given the goal of optimizing the total outcome of having more health messages being listened to. Now, it is learning a model of uh, people based on past data. And so there's people who have good transition probabilities, that, that is they'll respond well to the service calls. And there's people who have low transition probabilities, they will not respond as well to the service calls. The restless bandit is gonna go and pick people who have good transition probabilities. So in this itself, it is not selecting people who don't have good transition probabilities. And that could be because, you know, they are in difficult circumstances. Now we've tested for things like education, income, et cetera. We can't directly find a link there, but there's a group of people because of there's this whole cluster of people that we've used. We've used this clustering approach for not getting called because their transition probabilities are low. And that could be because there's something going on in their lives that they're not able to switch behaviors. So this is a very interesting problem. How do you deal with this? Because these are all people in low socioeconomic strata. If you, if you try to spread these resources towards people who in general are not, uh, who have low transition probabilities, you're taking away from people who could have benefited from the service call. So it's a very interesting and challenging problem about of fairness because it's not an overt uh, problem of race or religion or something like that. It's it's but but we want to somehow ensure some sort of equity there among people who have good transition probabilities and bad transition probabilities. So that's part of it. With respect to the phones, it's a very interesting question. Um, there's a lot of complications there. There's there's so often one phone in the family and it is shared by the whole family, including the husband. And so, so it, it sort of becomes this very complicated problem of how do you ensure that, uh, but going back to the question about people who don't have phones at all, this pro, I mean, 
in India right now, there's, uh, you know, it seems like a lot of people have phones. So there's a lot of phone penetration, but they, the people don't have phones. Arman has a different uh, way of intervening on them using workers who go to the homes and so on and so forth. So that's outside our program completely in terms of uh, what, because we just deal with the phones themselves. Uh, okay, there's a third question. I'm not sure if I understand it, but uh, Richard Treffer asks, uh, I wonder if you checked what the success rate would be uh, if instead of 40 of 400 contact 80 of 400 or 160 of 400. Not sure I understood that. Is it, is it okay, JC, if we, if we continue and then I'll come yeah, back to sure, the question sure. afterwards? Uh, yeah, okay, let's keep going. All right, so I'll take up uh, maybe seven, eight more minutes, uh, something like that, and then I'll wrap up and then we can have a discussion uh, on after that. So I'm going to change topics, talk about wildlife conservation. Um, so this is the Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda. I was there in Uganda looking at wildlife parks. This was back 2014 or so. Some of these pictures are from then. Some are from more recent uh, trips to other wildlife parks. One big problem that dangers face in trying to protect this beautiful wildlife here is snares or trap. Thousands of these snares, yeah, snares get placed to maim and kill wildlife. And you can imagine there's a hundreds of, there's just a hundreds of rangers, not a lot. Patrolling thousands and thousands of square kilometers to protect this wildlife. So we try to help them by giving them patrolling directions. We divide up the park into one kilometer by one kilometer grid square. And now we want to give them patrolling directions. So I'm just picking two of these grid squares. I'm going to call them two areas. And now you can imagine if the ranger always goes to area one, a poacher who can see where the rangers go, they have surveillance, will go to area two. And the poacher gets a positive reward of one, the ranger gets a negative reward minus one. If as a result, the poacher, the ranger always goes to area two, the poacher will go to area one. So any deterministic strategy, the poacher can defeat. If the ranger adopts a mixed strategy, 60% of the time they're in area one, 40% of the time in area two, a poacher trying to conduct surveillance will know, well, frequency-wise they were there 60% here, 40%, but what they'll do tomorrow remains unpredictable. And so this is the kind of randomized or mixed strategy we want to give rangers. But the poachers here are not these very strategic poachers. I mean, in past work, we've dealt with very strategic planners, particularly in the area of counterterrorism. Here, we are dealing with boundedly rational poachers, but we can learn about their behavior from past poaching data. So here, we are going to make predictions of poacher behaviors and then give using that prescriptions to rangers to patrol different areas. So fortunately, in the case of Uganda, we had 14 years of past poaching data. We have for each grid, kilo, grid square, but ranger patrol frequency, animal density, distance to river roads and villages and so forth. And we can build a model. I'm gonna skip those details in the interest of time. We did a first pilot study in 2016 selected two nine square kilometer areas shown here by these green dots. These were infrequently patrolled. Rangers had not gone there. And now we're telling them, if you go to these green areas, you're going to find new snares. And so rangers patrolled every day. They would send us for a month. And this just happened to be a month before the AMA 17 deadline. So basically, if the rangers found snares, we would get a paper done. If rangers didn't find snares, sorry, no paper. So that was, that was, those were the sticks. And so now rangers every day would email us what happened in the field. And initially there's nothing, but then they told us they found a poached elephant with its tusks cut off. Then they found a whole elephant snare roll. So poachers were active in the area. They were killing elephants, but before they could kill the next set of elephants, they removed an elephant snare roll hopefully saving lives of elephants. Then they found antelope snares that remo were removed and so forth. We then conducted a larger test in three national parks, two in Uganda, Queen Elizabeth, the Murchison Falls, one in Cambodia, Sri Park Wildlife Sanctuary. In each park, we identified 24 areas. We predicted some of those areas to be high risk, more snares would be found. We predicted some of them to be low risk, less snares would be found. Then we asked rangers to patrol these for six months. 
and then report back how many snares were found in each area. And what we find is where we predicted high risk, indeed more snares were found, where we predicted low risk, indeed less snares were found. So this tells us that this machine learning approach for making predictions about risk of finding snares was really working out. In fact, in Cambodia and the Sripok Wildlife Sanctuary, once they started using our system, which is called PAWS, the number of snare captures jumped from 101 to more than 521, more than five-fold increase. And these are pictures from this actual capture of snares based on our algorithm. In 2021, just in the month of March, they found a thousand snares using PAWS. So today we are very fortunate working with SMART, which is this global coalition of World Wildlife Fund, Wildlife Conservation Society, and 13 other non-governmental organizations. We have basically taken our PAWS software and integrated it with their SMART platform which means that PAWS is available to rangers over 800 national parks around the globe. So they can download PAWS to predict snares and remove them. And it's very exciting today to see rangers reporting that they've run PAWS, they're testing PAWS in the field, and it's now the integration is definitely done and all of this testing is uh, going on. So really very thrilling and exciting and hope this will contribute to, the, to helping these frontline workers, rangers, in being able to protect endangered wildlife around the globe. So having done this prediction, the next part is prescription. You want to be able to now tell the rangers where to patrol. But first is, do poachers actually get deterred by patrols? We didn't find this data in the literature. So to that end, we built this logistic regression model where we are trying to use past data to check if poachers are actually getting deterred by patrol effort. And what we find is indeed, if you look at this model in the different national parks in Uganda, based on this different national parks in Uganda, in terms of current effort, there's a positive coefficient for that, meaning that the more you patrol, the more snares you find, because that's true. If you patrol an area, you will find more snares there. But the past patrol you had done in an area reduces the number of snares found. So if you patrol some area, it is going to reduce the amount of snares that are placed in that area. So what this means is now we can go ahead with our Stackelberg model. If we patrol today, we are going to deter rangers, uh, deter poachers from putting snares in this area. So I'm going to skip over the details of the algorithm. So basically we have, an, we have this ranger who's going to patrol, we have Poachers are going to react using this model I just discussed. And again, we assume that this model is not exact. And so nature is going to choose parameter settings within some uncertain interval of the model to cause our patrolling strategy to perform as worse as possible. So we are, we are looking at a more robust patrolling strategy. So skip, skipping over details, if anybody is interested, those are in the UAI paper. We've looked at, uh, just to tr uh, try to wrap up the talk, we have recently also looked at drone-based surveillance of poaching. And this is work done with a nonprofit called Air Shepherd. And signaling using these drones in or, uh, deceptively in order to get the poachers to run away. And this requires strategic signaling because if we always signal that rangers are on the way when they're not, then poachers will figure this out. So they have to be deceptive in signaling. I'm gonna skip over those details. There's more recent work trying to look at bandit-based algorithms uh, because there are some parts which don't have data. And so you got to mix exploration and exploitation. We want to conduct patrols to detect illegal activity, but also to collect data to improve predictive models, exploitation and exploration. And so a AAAI 21 paper looked at a new algorithm to try to do this balancing of exploration exploitation in data scarce parks. Um, I'm now going to end by giving some lessons that we've learned, repeating some of the lessons that I mentioned earlier as well. So first lesson, achieving social impact and AI innovation go hand in hand. I hope I have shown you that, that we needed to do AI innovation to achieve social impact. Our goal is to empower nonprofits. That should be our goal to use AI tools. 
we have to look at the entire data to deployment pipeline in achieving social impact. If we just focus on improving algorithms, ignoring field testing, ignoring data gathering, we will not get to social impact. It's important to integrate these AI innovations in the NGO normal workflow to allow this to be applied in practice. It's important to step out of the lab and into the field. There are often instances where we will come up with a solution in the lab and then we, you know, tell that this is the solution and an NGO will tell us it doesn't work. And you go in the field and you realize why. It's important to step out of the, uh, of the lab for that reason. To embrace interdisciplinary research uh, in social work and conservation. And lack of data is the norm. I've had students who will, uh, look at the problem, say, well, there's not enough data, I can't solve this problem. But lack of data is the norm in many of these domains. It's a feature of the domain. And addressing the lack of data itself is the research problem. And you saw that in the problem with the homeless youth, for example, there's no social network available, but that in itself is the research that needed to be done uh, for, for addressing that problem. So with that, I'm going to end. If you're interested, uh, that's my Twitter handle where I often, uh, where I'll post our papers on a regular basis. So I'll end here. Thank you very much uh, for listening. And uh, I'm now very happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. Hey, thank you, uh, Melinda. I'll give a round of applause for everyone. Thank and, you. Uh, uh, that was a truly inspiring talk, a really incredible the, how far into the field you're able to get. It's a really quite inspiring for an AI researcher such as myself. Thank um, you so much. Th there is a, there's this little uh, um, uh, thread of questions here, which maybe we'll address first is the uh, uh, Eli Senubari, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, says, I hope the poachers don't read this paper. <laughs> so uh, Dave Radke says, uh, can you account for the, you addressed this a little bit, but the, uh, the poachers uh, are changing their strategies because they know that the, the pause is being used by the poachers. Wonderful question. So I have two answers. First, uh, we're using this Stackelberg model and uh, at least with respect to the game theory portion, um, the Stackelberg model basically assumes that the poachers have full knowledge of the rangers patrolling strategy. So in, in that way, uh, saying that we're using a Stackelberg model doesn't reveal anything because it already assumes that the poachers have full knowledge of whatever patrolling is being done. However, we are using this uh, behavior model of the poachers and that is a little bit tricky. So we have talked uh, with our colleagues in wildlife conservation about how aware the poachers might be of changes in strategies and so on and so forth. So one thing is uh, we don't publish any maps of how, where the high risk areas are in different parts and so forth in our papers. So at least we make sure that doesn't happen. But poachers have noticed uh, that there is an increase in snare capture. Um, 2019, when we were just about to go to Cambodia to, to work with the rangers there, uh, pause was being deployed. Apparently that led to the poachers noticing more snares were being captured. And as a result, they attacked one of the rangers. The ranger uh, got injured, was, uh, had to go to the hospital to recover and so forth. So it is a concern um, that, uh, that uh, you know, as, as AI-based strategies become most, more effective in protecting wildlife, that uh, the poachers may become more aggressive. Um, and we have noticed some of it, but uh, it's something that we'll have to figure out how to deal with as we go along. And it's an important and interesting topic. As far as shifting uh, strategies uh, over time, we are continuously updating our data and using that to come up with more improved, uh, you know, take the most recent data to continue to make sure that we provide the most recent heat maps and so on and so forth. But I'll, I think one important point I want to make here, what I've presented, uh, we've presented our initial solutions and I'm glad that they are of some use to the frontline workers. But there is so much more that we as AI community can contribute to because these are massive, massive problems. Um, you know, I mean, for example, if people may know about wildlife conservation, I mean, you know, projections were at least when uh, Allah saw them that 
the demand for ivory is so much greater and the projections are that we're going to run out of elephants very soon um and so you know the more ai researchers can step in uh, as well as other I mean, we need people from other disciplines as well to fight this fight i think uh, that will be better so there's a lot lot to be done that we 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 can do as an ai community to contribute to this fight absolutely yeah uh it, are there other questions uh if anybody has one you can just turn on your mic and ask the question uh, Richard, your question, we, we didn't, I think you need to clarify, we could, uh, we could if you would like to, to ask uh, Melinda your question directly, maybe that would be a good idea. Okay, I'll try. Uh, so in your research, you were saying that, I think, if I understood it, that there were 400 at-risk youth and you, and, and the, the people were able to contact 40 of them directly, and then you hope to, this information gets spread amongst the 400. But so my question is, well, what happens if you increase the number of at-risk youths that are directly contacted? You know, maybe 80 get directly contacted or 120 or all 400. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good question. But I just picked the number 400, uh, by the way. I mean, the total numbers were 750 overall, but, but I, I get the thrust of the question. Yeah, if we are able to increase the number of seeds, then you will be more effective. However, there is a cost because the way this works is that these youth, um, it's difficult, you know, they, they, are, they have come from very difficult backgrounds. Um, and so getting them to sit in one room and having a social worker educate them uh, about that, about HIV prevention, for example, is not, not easy. And so we have very small uh, training sessions and therefore it's, you know, it takes time and so to intervene on these number of youth, we have to have social workers work that much more. So um, more seeds, and there's of course pay, uh, theoretical papers at least that show that uh, with more seeds, you can be less clever in your algorithm to um, you know, get, get similar types of effects and so forth. But uh, you know, we actually have limitations. We have costs that we have to overcome in order to get more seeds. So, yeah, it's a very uh, interesting trade-off in terms of um, this cost versus benefit. But yeah, indeed, if, if we have more seeds, we will be more effective and maybe won't have to be as clever with our algorithms. Does that answer your question now? It does. I, I mean, I guess I'm asking it in the, you know, how many seeds can we afford not to but uh, contact? But yeah, thank you. All right, thanks, Richard. So Kate, uh, your, your hand is raised, so go ahead. Yeah, so I thought that was a wonderful talk. So thank you very much. Um, the one thing you've highlighted uh, across sort of you know, all the examples that you gave was your engagement with NGOs. Um, so, you know, I was wondering if you had like any advice um, sort of for AI researchers who are interested in working with the NGOs who are like, who have the domain expertise, or are there any, you know, things that as an AI researcher we should be careful about? So thank you for that question, Kate. And I'll advertise one program we run out of uh, Google that I hope uh, people will apply to. So we, so this program got inspired by my visit to a university in India where there were 50 PhD students and they were all very interested in AI for social impact and they weren't quite sure where to get started. So slightly different from what you are uh, asking, Kate, but I'll take this opportunity to advertise this program anyhow. So we now have this program of matchmaking. So we'll, we will issue a call uh, in two, three months from now. The program ran in 2020 and 2021. So professors apply from around the world, NGOs apply, and then we run a matchmaking speed dating service. So professor meets with three NGOs, NGO meets with three professors. And if they like each other, anybody likes each other, they can write a proposal together. And then we fund those proposals. Uh, to, to basically do work on AI for social impact. So if anybody is interested in the audience, um, you know, two, in two to three months, there should be a call and uh, please do apply. We would love to welcome your applications. And it's a very low cost applications, name, CV, uh, a few areas of interest. So we've kept it really low, low effort um, to apply. So, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, lessons uh, working with the NGOs, I mean, 
Some of them are things I'm sure you're very aware of, but uh, I've had postdocs students who haven't quite figured this out. So one is patience. Um, you know, so I've um, you know I've had a student who will go talk to an NGO, and then after one or two meetings, come out and say, "Well, they haven't given me like a mathematical problem." I mean, basically, they're looking for the NGO to start uh, writing on the board uh, sum over i x i. This is the problem, and now you can go optimize it. That's just not the way it's going to work. It's a lot of meetings, a lot of like uh, you know, just patience in trying to understand the problems space, trying to understand what problem the NGO is worried about, and then and then you can start developing a solution. The second is respect. I, I'm sure uh, people are aware, but, you know, these are just, you know, we are computer scientists. We may feel that, you know, our, we, are, we are AI researchers, which we are at the top of the world, but this, you know, they are experts. They're experts not in AI, but they're real experts in their own field. And sometimes I find that people don't quite have that, you know, it's like, well, how come you don't understand what uh, equilibrium is or something like that? And it's, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, they're, they're experts in their own field and they don't, they don't know what's Nash equilibrium or whatever that, you know. So, so I think those, so I often I find um, that in walking into these meetings, uh, humility and trying to truly respect the other side and trying to understand that they have so much more to contribute helps in terms of, uh, opening up communication channels and, and really, the third is immersion uh, has helped us. I mean, all of these are just basically talking to partners. So I'll give you an example. We were working with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. And uh, so we were trying to come up with a scheduler that was going to compete with their human schedulers for scheduling police on, uh, you know, their officers on trains. And initially the meetings, you know, were all very, well, not the most friendly ones because there's like an AI system that is going to compete with the human schedulers and it just was not going very well. But our students went on patrols with those officers repeatedly trying to understand their concerns, trying to understand what the constraints are and so on and so on. And at the end, once with all of this done, this partnership being built, at the end when there was a competition, human versus AI, and the AI system won, and this was declared in a big meeting that the AI system had done better. The human schedulers actually went and hugged the postdoc and said, you know, you've helped us by building this system, which I thought was a very inspiring scene and was only possible because of this deep partnership that got built up. So maybe that doesn't, I mean, maybe that helps a little bit in terms of uh, some of the, yeah, but th there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot to be done there. Yeah, thank you. So it's like, you know, so there's like, you know, the hard work that goes into the technical contributions, but you're saying it's as hard just to develop the relationships in the first place so that you can actually begin to understand the problems and have a hope of doing technical contributions. And as we were discussing this morning, you know, there's so much work that goes, goes in before we even start writing these papers in AI for social impact, because it's like uh, the immersion, the partnerships, figuring out what is the problem, trying to model the problem. So many choices that get made. And I suppose we haven't yet figured out how to scientifically communicate all of that hard work, at least in computer science. Maybe in HCI or something like that, they do better uh, a better job of it, but at least in AI, it's like we just start, you know, motivation a little bit, uh, then there's like a problem description, a little bit of the model, and ah, here comes the algorithm, that's where all our, uh, but, but there's so much more that we do that I think it would be nice if you are able to communicate that with each other and share. Uh, and I'm sure you have done a lot of this yourself and we would love to learn from, like you were saying in the morning, you know, the work you're doing with firefighters and so forth. We would love to learn from that, you know, what, what were the problems you faced? I mean, what were the modeling choices that you saw and how did you deal with the lack of data and so on and so forth? Yeah, so there's, yeah. We need avenues to communicate all of that other work beyond the, just the algorithmic work that we do. We need a, you know, special workshops just for that. I agree. For the pre-problem problem problems. <laughs> Maybe that should be the title of the workshop, pre-problem problems. Well, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, well, we've we've run over time, uh, but uh, that was an absolutely inspiring talk, and uh, I think Kate's question at the end and your response was was truly uh, really good for computer scientists to hear that message. I think because interacting with the with uh, different people is is very important, different groups and, and uh, things like that. So, um, so if there are no more questions, then I, I think well, they'll thank uh, Melin Tambe again for an absolutely wonderful day, and I'm sure all the students and uh, people that you met today appreciate it no end. And um, I'll be in touch to with an email uh, to thank you as well. So, uh, thank, thank you, again. thank you, thank you for a wonderful visit. Thank you to all of the students who met me. Thank you for all the questions. Absolutely wonderful visit. You have been a great host. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Hope that everything goes well with Google Research in India and when you're back there. Thank Hopefully you. We get to go back. You get to go back soon. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, Melinda.